Today, we have Marissa Coors, who is the daughter of Adrienne Shapiro. Now, you remember Adrienne appeared in our previous podcast episode. Marissa will walk us through some of the hurdles and her ultimate success on her sickle cell disease care journey. Living your life, please help me welcome Miss Marissa Coors. Welcome to Living Your Life, Marissa. Thank you so much for being here. How are you doing? I'm well, thank you. How are you? I'm doing great. You know what? We cannot do living your life without my friend, my my partner man, my my ride or die this dude that's with me in this whole sickle cell fight, Dr. Corey A. Bear. What's happening, man? It's it's been a good day so far. And you know, you might catch this. It's been a good day. I didn't even have to use my AK. You may catch that reference. I, I may have caught that reference. I have, I have. I know what that is, man. But we are here with Marissa Coors today, Dr. A. Bear. And let me tell you, this is one person I think is a great inspiration for people with sickle cell disease because she has a very interesting story. And we're going to have a conversation today that is going to get kind of heavy here today. I mean, really, because, um, you know, Marissa, let's just get into it. What was your sickle cell like as, as a child? What was your childhood like? Well, I'm a fifth generation sickle cell pa um, patient, so um, I, I was both blessed and cursed to come into this world with a family that absolutely understood this illness. And as such, um, from the moment I could speak, I, I was being taught to advocate for myself and to tell people what I needed and not necessarily ask. Yeah. Yeah. That that's important. And how old were you when you were doing this? Two. My my first uh, lesson. Two. I'm sorry, did you say like one, two? <laughs> one, two. That, that's that's two. strong. That's strong. Because usually people are asking for their noony or their yeah. bottle. And you're asking yeah. for uh uh tertiary uh care uh in, in a tertiary care facility for your sickle cell. I, mm -hmm. I love it. I love it. I love it. That's strong because I'm telling you, you know what I'm doing that too. <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> I, I wasn't this smart. Even. <laughs> Nothing. And, and when you say you were advocating, how does a two year old advocate for themselves? Well, the first thing my mother ever taught me was to say no, like this. And ultimately, it was if I was having a crisis in a space that the nurses wanted to put an IV in, I was to cover that space with my hand and tell them no. And so when I did that, the nurses immediately were like, okay, what's wrong with her? Um, and they kept trying to get me to move my hand and you know, they tried all the tricks. Oh, you know, we're not gonna hurt you. We're here to help you. It's a magic needle. Like needles cannot be magic. Don't do that. And um, so, let me get this right, Marissa. You never, you never fail for look at the lollipop. No, no. <laughs> he, he you didn't fall for that. I can tell you why, though. Um, okay. You know how when children go to the the pediatrician and they put you on your parents' lap, like to give you your shots or to take yes. blood. Yes. Yeah. Well, they put me on my father's lap to take blood. And the nurse kept saying, look at daddy. And daddy was like, look at daddy. So I'm looking at daddy. The nurse pricks my finger. My father passes out because he passes out at the sight of blood. And <laughs> so your father said, your finger get pricked. So your father, ha, ha, that's it. Like, like, no, she stabbed me and he passed out. No, I'm not looking yeah. at you no more. Yeah, we're just yeah. That's called PTSD. Yeah. We're going to discuss that with the a uh, little, bit, <laughs> little bit. Yeah. That, I understand that. I understand. Yeah. So now you were advocating at two years old, which had to lead to, you know, when you were transitioning uh, from there to a teenager, now you can advocate strongly on your own. Yes and no. Yeah, yes and no. Because at two... You know, you're a cute kid and you're sick. So people automatically just want to take care of you. It doesn't matter what you have, what you look like. You're a sick kid. We want to make you better. And so at two, when I was saying no, the nurses had a lot of um, patience and a lot of, you know, kind of what's going on here. But 
they they weren't they weren't threatening to kick me out of the hospital for being uncooperative, right? So at two, when I'm doing this and my mother comes in and they say to her, well, she's not allowing us to put the IV in. And she says to them, well, did you ask her why she's doing that? And immediately the nurses were like, why would we ask a two-year-old? And of course they asked me and I said, it hurts. And I offered them my other arm. And then we learned, oh, okay, she's trying to, to tell us something. Well, when you do that at 18, 19, 20, 21, there is no why. What, what do you mean no? It's, well, if you're going to refuse and, and be non-compliant, then you can just go home and we'll discharge you. And it's like yeah. a real conversation. Well, you know, mm -hmm. and th that that's so poignant because when I, I have to educate um, in, in a classroom setting, uh, my, my colleagues, nurses, doctors, nurse practitioners, PAs, whomever, um, about uh, their initial uh, interaction with the sickle cell patient in a pain crisis. And so I always tell them when you're, you know, a, a two year old, three year old girl with a pink dress on and you just kind of whimpering in pain, you know, because of your sickle cell, everybody cares. Oh, we don't want it to be in pain. But when you are a 24 year old, six foot tall black man with priapism and asking for morphine for pain, you know, they automatically say, no, you can't have the pain and not, you can't have the pain medicine. And so what we have to do is have to de deprogram them so that they can understand that that kid is the same person as that adult. The pain has only gotten worse over time. So they need to right before they when they grab that chart and it says mm -hmm. cell patient, they need to take out of their mind what they're going to see because it doesn't matter what they're going to see because they're going to treat the patient the same. And that's one of the hardest things that I've had to overcome in trying to train people how to tra take care of patients with sickle cell. Yeah, because it, that's a, that's a, uh, unfortunately that's a reality for us sickle cell patients, yeah. uh, finding a consistent doctor because, you know, you go into an emergency room, that emergency room doctor and it might not be the same as the last time you were in the hospital with the last emergency room doctor. And that's why you feel like, well, I came back here because I liked the way I was treated. And and now it's not the same. And so, you know, you start looking at some of these stuff like, you know, I have to ask you, Marissa, after going through two years old, no, then to uh, being told we ain't asking you why, this is what this is to, to, to how is it your sickle cell now? And, and what are you experiencing now? Or how are you handling the, the situations at your age right now? Well, you know, to be perfectly honest, um, I've been at the same hospital since I was 10, 11 years old, and I'm now 46 as of May. So I bet they didn't see you coming now. Oh, <laughs> I bet when they look, when they get that first little inkling you coming, I bet they, they take care of some business. Am I right? Yeah. Y'all get ready. Here come Marissa. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> That's a different feeling. Hey, Miss Coors coming. Y'all get ready. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, understand. I, bet, I bet even though your names are spelled different, I bet that they, they, they treat you better than Michael Coors. Yeah. <laughs> come on. <laughs> Got to be better. But yes, but it it was a very long road to sure. that. And um, you know, as of twenty eighteen, I've only been in the hospital three times. So I went from being in the hospital four to six months out of the year throughout the majority of my thirties to only mm -hmm. being in the hospital three times, really in my forties. So. When I left so, the hospital, I knew everybody. Yeah. So let me ask you guys, how how did you do that? How do you how what are you doing that some of other people are not doing that you've been in the hospital only three times in the last five years? Well, the first thing I did was I got rid of the porticast. Um oh. I got rid of I I was emotionally, mentally manipulated by my nurses to put in porticals because it made their life easier. 
Yes. Um, and unfortunately, my body was like not hearing a quarter calf or a pick line or a midline or any other kind of line. So for four years straight, I had multiple infections. And when I say multiple, I mean, I had two infections that I'm the only person in the world ever to have had. Wow. Like well, can, can, papers. Can, 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 I, can I hold you up one second? Just for the people that may not know what that is. Okay, a porticath is a catheter that is indwelling that stays in you all the time underneath yeah. your skin so that when they need to access you to either take blood, give you medicine, blah, 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 they can just numb it up and then stick you right into the, to the catheter that's underneath, usually kind of in your shoulder. But the problem with that is, as she's mentioning, is the fact that um, when you have an indwelling catheter and even though they're supposed to wipe it off and keep it under, you know, uh, the little uh, uh, plastic cover, sometimes it gets infected. And when it gets infected, it's an indwelling thing that lives in your body, which means you are infected. And sometimes it gets colonized with bacteria. Then you become colonized with that bacteria. And, you know, for some, it's okay. But for some people, you got to remember that it's an indwelling catheter and your body will uh, recognize it as foreign and then actually set up a graft versus host reaction so that maybe even set you up for some autoimmune diseases for some people. We don't really know for a fact, but some people say that. So I just kind of want to clarify that people understand what we're talking about. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, you did that. Yeah. I clearly understand and knew it. <laughs> <laughs> well, go ahead. Go ahead, Marissa. Uh, no, I mean, exactly what the doctor just said. It I had had pick lines throughout my 20s and they all ended in some weird kind of infection that I was able to see and, and catch immediately. So it, it wasn't the nightmare that the porta caps were. And um, frankly, the reason for making me get the porta caps was not because I was uncomfortable, but because the nurses were uncomfortable. Uncomfortable. Yeah. And and yeah. they like to use that umbrella term, but I'm uncomfortable. Like, what does your comfort have to do with my life though? Yeah. No nothing. 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 I I'm uncomfortable laying in this bed right now with this pain <laughs> crisis. I stay uncomfortable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and let me you know, and that's what another thing too. Because we've had this from two years old up to where we are today. And I like to bring this up to just see mentally, how are you doing right now? Because I know that mental health is a serious part of this. It's a serious part of sickle cell disease, understanding like having to battle depression and don't even know why and don't even understand when you're depressed. So how do you feel about the mental health and sickle cell? Um, I think it's just as important as our physical needs. Um, and, and honestly, I think it's probably more important than our physical needs because we've been dealing with pain since birth. So by the time you're 10, like you pretty much have figured out how to how to bob and, and weave and manipulate your mind to get through right. the pain so that you can do whatever it is you need to do before you have to go to the hospital. Like you just yeah. start doing that naturally. But the mental and emotional stuff that comes from your transformative years right so from mm -hmm. 18 to 30 really mm -hmm. uh, that's something that people aren't prepared for because i mean in all honesty why why would you be prepared for the world that helped to raise you you grew up in hospitals right you grew up with nurses you grew up with doctors right. why would one have to be prepared for those people who have taken such good care of you as a child, mm -hmm. who educated you, who instilled in you, you know, how to take care of and protect yourself. Why would you believe that you had to then protect yourself from those very people? But in actuality, you do, because the minute that you even look like an adult, even though you may not be one, they start with the, the mental games. They start with the interrogations and the making you prove to them why you need to be there. And, and furthermore, why do you need this care plan? And then even 
more so every every action that you do even though it's a natural action or even reaction the, the cancer patient next door is doing exactly what you're doing but somehow because you the sickle cell patient are doing it it's vilified and and it's wrong and to emotionally have to deal with that is a lot yeah. and and nobody's prepared for it and you don't even know how to verbalize what's happened right Right, because it's, it is shocking. And you know, Dr. A. Barrett, that is, that is something that we have to deal with because our pain is already elevating as we get older. I'm always constantly thinking about, is this the year I die? I'm always worried about how I'm going to be treated if I go in the hospital. I'm, it may be best I just stay home and deal with this on my own. Up is too bad. I got to go in here. Then when I get in there, have a seat. We'll be with you in a minute. And then my pain levels are 10. See all the mind games that's already being played that I have to focus on. And I'm sitting in here and I get a doctor that says, uh, well, you don't look like you're in a sickle cell crisis. When my body is telling me clearly I'm in a sickle cell crisis or else I would not be here. Then you take my blood work. Then you say, well, you are in a sickle cell crisis. Now you want to believe me. Now it's another hour before I get a pain medicine. And in that time, I could possibly die. And that's what I want to talk about right now, Dr. Hebert, how, how how that looks to you. Now, I know not you, Dr. Hebert, but I'm just saying physician. I get it. Yeah. Because I mean, I, like I said when I, earlier, I, I trained doctors to, to kind of deal with this and, and try to have some empathy. You know, the difference between empathy and sympathy is empathy is you place yourself in that particular situation and then feel how you would feel. Sympathy is I feel sorry for you in that situation. It's a very different thing. Never for the grace of God go I. That is empathy. Right. So um, you know, we know that the crisis get, get more intense as you get older, right? We know that you've already had a, 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 um, what is it? Expiration date put on your body from when you were much old, much younger, when they said you probably won't live to be past blank. So every time you go in the hospital, and this is not just for sickle cell patients, please stay out of the hospital if you can, anybody. But especially on, on July 1st, I think a lot of people don't know this. And this is why we got to talk about living your life in this show. When you, you were a medical student. On June 30th, you're a doctor taking care of people alone July 1st. You were an intern June 30th, and now you're a resident in charge of all the interns July 1st. You were a resident in the hospital July, I mean, June 30th, and on June July 1st, you are a person in charge of a whole unit. So the, the one day you don't want to be in a hospital is what? July 1st. Okay. Okay. Because that's when everything changed. That's across the whole United States. It's not. So I would say if you could avoid the hospital for any reason in the first month, uh, in the first 30 days of July or the first, you know, first uh, uh, 30 days, you know, after June 30th, July, August, I'd probably stay out of hospitals. But people like the sickle cell can't stay out of the hospital. Okay. Because when you go, you have to go. That whole mind game, all you're discussing right now. It's it, it's something that weighs on you, and we know that if you have a lot of stress, it increases your cortisol level. If you have increased cortisol level, that means it decreases your immunity. You decrease your immunity, that means you get strep infection and end up in the hospital. So we got to start talking about how to decrease the stress and increase the mental awareness and increase the mental strength of patients with sickle cell. And the only way you can do that is to fix the system. Marissa, we look forward to you coming back and telling us about the Brittany Hightower uh, project that you all are doing and uh, we thank you so much for spending some time with us great discussion i love it thank you so much round of applause ladies and gentlemen for miss miss marissa course miss marissa course ladies and gentlemen great job thank you so much for coming on living your life man another great episode thank you marissa